All right, everyone, it is interview time, and we are here with repeat guests. When I say repeat guests, I believe Lisa Hendrickson Jack was on our show like years ago. I think it was 2018. Yeah, like year two of Shameless Sex. Wow, we getting old over right, here. Right. And she, because one of my really good friends who you know, we had consulted you when yeah. she was through her pregnancy journey, and you oh, consulted her. with her. Oh. Yeah, and she had told me about you, and then she was like, "You should have Lisa on the show." She listened to every one of your podcasts, and and when we had you, I was like, "It was very learned, very insightful, so much." And so we are here today. We will revisit some of the pieces that we revisited or revisited before, but also Lisa co-authored a new book uh, that is uh, out called "Real Food for Fertility." I love a good, like, simple, clean title. I wish our book had that. Anyways, not about our book, but <laughs> but we are super <laughs> excited to have you here, and um, and just wanted to say this to our listeners, we are going to talk about nutrition and health and fertility for people who want to have babies or get pregnant, or maybe you have, but also if you don't want to get pregnant, maybe you don't want to have babies and you want to be preventative and not be on hormonal birth control. Um, and no, this is not a whole bunch of like woohoo, whatever bullshit. Like there's actually science that backs this up. So we are confident in this conversation. We love Lisa Hendricks and Jack. So Lisa, welcome back to our show. And if you could just tell us a little bit more, even though you've been on our show before, as if our listeners are brand new to you, tell us a little more how you got to where you are to day in the field of sexual health. Mm. Well, great. Thank you so much, first of all, for such a lovely introduction. It's fun to be back. And in terms of the field of sexual health, I mean, I am a certified fertility awareness educator, not something that everyone <laughs> comes across every day, but it's essentially just this knowledge and information about how your menstrual cycle works. Most women have no idea that we're not fertile every single day. And that you can learn to track your fertile signs, whether that's your cervical fluid or your temperature to figure out which days you can get pregnant, which days you can't. And so this lends itself to many, many interesting conversations in that field of sexual health when it comes to having control over your sexuality, your body, when those conversations you have with your partner. I think that we live in a an interesting time when as women, many of us are just, it seems like we're expected to be on birth control. So we're expected to have our bodies just available all the time. Um, and there are some side effects that many women experience, including low libido. And so there are other alternatives. And I think that that's where one of the ways that I enter into that conversation, because many women don't know that it's possible to prevent pr pregnancy without hormones. And that allows you to keep your libido and enjoy your, you know, hormones the way they're meant to be. And uh, and so I, I mean I'll I'll kind of throw it back to you, but I think that's a, a really interesting way that because um, my 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 field isn't directly in the field of sexual health, but because I'm always talking about all the things related to conception and fertility and birth control, that's really how I am enter into that conversation. Yeah, and hormones are I didn't realize how important slash like how much they can take over your whole life. I don't know what the word is for that right now. Yeah. Um, but, so not even like more like importance. It's such a small word for what it is because hormones, the older I've, I've, I've been and, and gotten thankfully, but wiser, the crazier <laughs> that the hormones are, they fluctuate and I had no idea. And it's been a long time for me to be on birth control and Amy as well. And our partners both have vasectomies. Um, so I haven't had to go on birth control, but you know, my stepdaughters, there's three of them and they're all in relationships and on birth control. And the oldest one was just talking about this. She's like in love with her partner, but isn't ready to have babies. But her IUD has been really affecting her life, her sex life. And she's, it, it's uncomfortable for her and kind of her body's rejecting it. Um, and I was excited that we were having a show with you because it's really hard. And I never preach to people what to do because I'm not an expert like you. I know when I was on birth control from 15 to 33, I definitely had a lot of shifts and changes in my body. And then when I got off of it, it took a while for things to get back to what they, I guess they were supposed to be maybe. Um, but now both Amy and I are on hormones, not for uh, pregnancy prevention, but for making me at least not a crazy fucking bitch. Because <laughs> I started again. So I take hormones just for her because she's. Yeah. Like, if I take them too, she's less crazy. I'm just kidding. That's not what's no, happening. <laughs> but we have the with testosterone. And people yeah. have been like, they cut, we've got been shamed on the air by somebody that says, what are they? They're just, they're like souped up bitches, so on, like souped up on test, on, on pee. On pee. And we're like, no, it's not like no, that, bro. We, I'm not we, a beard. We're just like hyper in general. Like we were like that already. And yeah. 
So, but yeah, this is and, and like this and isn't I, about that. But it, this but is what I'm saying. These are all horrible. Those people related. that said that, I think they think that we're getting like some kickbacks. Like we don't get kickbacks for talking about this. <laughs> Not at all. It's no. for and and every person. And I'm sure Lisa, you can attest to this. And and I know that you're a woman in your 30s who's had three children, and you've used the methods and applied the methods that you've written about um, to your own life, and you've helped other people. And your Fertility Friday podcast has been out. For a long longer time. than ours. Yeah, yeah, way longer than ours. Yeah. Right. This is year 10. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Congratulations. Yeah. So, and I am getting to a question. I just I had like to to premise this conversation with you with a few stories about how this is important for a lot of folks out there. And if you're a dude and you can't get pregnant, it's but you're uh with you know, Volvo owners who could, it's also important to listen to this. So mm-hmm. FYI. You're responsible too, just you so you know. Are. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about what is a vital sign because you have a book about the fifth vital sign. And then let's also talk about how is this related to a person in um, their cycles or where they're at, even in terms of their age? Mm -hmm. I mean, the vital sign piece, I think it even ties into what you were alluding to, which is that you, I think we're told that our menstrual cycle is only related to when you want to have babies, but our menstrual cycle kind of governs our experience with our hormones. And like you said, like if your hormones are out of balance, you can feel completely insane all the time. So I would definitely argue that understanding your cycle and aiming towards having a healthy hormone balance, especially if you're not on uh, contraceptives or transitioning off of contraceptives, is key to like feeling normal and feeling good and having healthy overall experience of life. Like no one wants raging PMS like for half of their life. You know what I mean? So it it does affect all of us. And so, you know, a vital sign is simply a way that we measure how our body's functioning. And the most common vital signs are things like our um, blood pressure, our heart rate, our respiratory rate, body temperature. And when we think about any of those common vital signs, if you go to the doctor and they measure your blood pressure, not only if it's if your blood pressure is off, not only does it tell your doctor that there's something wrong in general, but if it's too high, there's a short list of things that it could be, or if it's too low, for example. And so similarly, when we look at our menstrual cycle that way, if you do have a specific kind of like hormonal, emotional kind of things going on and, and we're tracking the cycle and we can see that it's happening at a certain time in the cycle, that can tell us a lot about what's going on hormonally at that time. And that can be the first step towards actually moving towards Im- improving and, and, and balancing that. Um, and similarly, even more severe issues, like if you're having abnormal bleeding all the time or if you're having pain with sex all the time it can be a sign that there's something that we should be looking deeper in and if someone doesn't tell you about those connections then you might just not know which is why we we really need to kind of look beyond just this possibility of conception and look at our cycle as like a part of a healthy human body mm. and then when dudes man straight because you know <laughs> they do uh this is also something to look at Man straight. Are they menstruating now? We do a podcast on menstruation. <laughs> we do. Yeah. I don't know. I know. Dr. Doobie. There's no Doobie. science. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, we need, but we need to. <laughs> How do we know? What are the sign, what's the vital sign when he's menstruating? What should I, what should I do? <laughs> oh. Love you guys. <laughs> Blessings. <laughs> Is it like sympathy, uh, like sympathy yeah. hormonal stuff? Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. eating like a pint of ice cream crying. And I'm like, oh, you're menstruating with me. I, I love mean, it. This is such a tangent, but it's with the menstruating thing. I just I just love like it's like a it's like a it's a not love hate. It's like a love. love sometimes it can be hard. But so I'm all adults, just by the way, when all adults are having whatever it's PMS or if, even if it's not hormonal, you're just having a hard time. And your way of reacting to it is, is like I can look at it and be like you are like a five year old having a tantrum right now. It's kind of cute to me. I'm it kind of like, oh, you know, like, and I'm not going to like be belittling, like, oh, look at you and your tantrum. We're like, okay, so you're having a hard time. And like, so what is your, what is like, it's kind of like with a kid, like, I, you know, yeah, what does hard time need right now? Like, I don't, does hard time need a hug? I tell my partner, I'm like, you're 55. You're probably going to go through menopause soon. So don't worry. Okay. Just, I got you. You need a hug? I got you. Hey, yeah. it's not fair. It can't always be just us doing all yeah. the things. Yeah. No, all of us are having tantrums all the time and maybe not all the time, but we're all capable of it. Okay, so we talked about the, <laughs> the vital sign part. Um, and then, so I, but I wanted to bring it back because, well, no, well, well, I think we can tie this in with what you were talking about earlier with um, your, you know, stepdaughters because of this. Well, we are talking a lot about fertility. Also, we we're talking about like, what if you don't want to get pregnant? So we're very, very grateful for birth control, everyone. I would like to just announce that we are grateful <laughs> for birth control. We are so grateful for the option to have an abortion if you need that. 
And so we are not talking shit about these things and saying that they should not exist. Uh, but we just want to be more aware of you know, how hormones affect our body. What are our choices? What are our options that are available? So yes, so we know talking about hormones can be a little problematic or taking hormones. Sorry, taking hormones can be problematic for a lot of bodies, especially if we like start at a young age. So what are the some of the most common issues or health risks that you are seeing from people who are taking hormonal birth control? And then maybe we can lead that into like the options of, we're talking about like the withdrawal method that, ooh, so heated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. I think I think it's gotten a little bit better over the years. I feel like when I was first podcasting, it was more of a, you know, tricky territory. If you were criticizing the pill, people were kind of losing their minds. I think that it's settled down now after maybe, you know, the pill's been out since 1960. Like there's a lot of data that indicates that there are tons of women who experience side effects. But with that said, not everybody experiences it in the same way. So I think it's helpful to kind of see like, well, what does the science say about it? So I think for what the research says, plus many of the conversations over the years that I've had, some of the most common side effects related to hormonal birth control use are depression, um, mood changes, things like anxiety, panic attacks, those kinds of things, um, as well as low libido and uh, a change in sexual function. And, and those aren't the only side effects, but I think those are kind of some of the most common ones. And uh, what's interesting ab about that is that I always say that a lot of women, you know, go on contraceptives when they're younger, like when they're in their teens, maybe shortly after their first period. And arguably, those individuals wouldn't have known themselves necessarily yet. I mean, did you know yourself when you were 15? Like, certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I've heard many, um, like, I, I've just heard this many, many times, which is like, I just thought I wasn't that sexual of a person, or I just thought I was kind of a depressed person. Or I've also heard it described as kind of like a uh, not really feeling like the high highs or the low lows of life. So you you don't necessarily feel sad all the time, but you don't necessarily feel like fully happy or you don't necessarily feel those depths of emotion, like you're kind of static. And so that's how I've heard it described a lot. And so then when people come off of contraceptives, then that's when they're kind of like, oh my gosh, I always thought it was just me. I always thought I was just like a sad person and it felt like a veil was lifted or I feel like I'm more like myself and things like that. And, um, and again, not everybody experiences that, but Within the first year on contraceptives, they say about 50% of women, the stat is that they come off of it. So within that first year of using contraceptives, half of the people taking them are not satisfied with their experience to the point that either they're ditching it or they're switching to something else in the search of the right one. So, you know, if you think about anyone in your life who's taking contraceptives, a lot of people are taking a lot of the contraceptives because maybe this one didn't work. So they're trying this one, they're trying that one. This one gave this one side effect or whatever. And so um, again, not everybody has that experience. But what about the 50% of people who do, right? Like what do we what do we have for them? So I I I really think that um it's not about shaming anybody, but it's about having that information, knowing that it's normal, knowing that if it if it if you experience that, you're not the only one. Um, and knowing that there are other alternatives if it really doesn't work for you. I took so many different kinds of birth control because I was one of those people that when I moved to Israel, the birth control that I had taken in the States wasn't available. So I got the IUD per my dearest friend in the world, Amy. Oops. Amy Marino. Non hormonal. It was the non hormonal and one. It was a non hormonal one. And that's hey, at I least got... you didn't get pregnant like I did on it. <laughs> Oh, exactly. No. <laughs> but my body felt like it was birthing a small baby alien that was stabbing me from the inside out every single month. And I also had so much weight fluctuation. And I'm a pretty consistent person. Since I haven't been on birth control, I was like, wow, I actually don't balloon and then and then thin and then blue. It's like it was wild how how different even my cycles like the amount of water retention and, and things and then i also had i did the nuva ring i don't even know if that's around anymore i did that one made me want to kill most people around me that one yeah then i had I, what i mean i did so many different forms of birth control i would get huge like cystic acne with some i would um some of them i would just like not be able to move for a few days like before my it was so weird and then sometimes people are stoked though they're like well i won't get my period for you know, a whole year because of this thing that I'm on. And I'm like, I'm like, really? And, and and some people are stoked about that. And that's okay. I'm not shaming anyone either. I didn't realize how birth control and diff different forms, right? Not even just the pill was affecting my body until I was off of it. And uh, I tried so many different ones. I'm not even going down 
the list because it was um, really difficult for me to find something. And then the one that I did take all the time started killing people because they had blood clots. And I like, it was like Yaz or something. The, yeah, it, it was, was Yaz. Yaz, Yaz, I remember Yaz, Yaz, Yaz. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I remember Yaz because it held the commercials. It was yeah. like really like yeah. all these and all these happy people and all the things. All and for the people. record, it's not just Yaz that has the blood clot thing. So uh, when I was writing the first book, The Fifth Vital Sign, I remember um, I had this thing in there that was like the warning label thing that I, I made and to kind of show like these are all the side effects that could happen. And some of them are life threatening, like the blood clot, stroke, pulmonary embolism, those kinds of things. And there is a stat in in one of the papers that I read that says that the number of women, um, unfortunately, who die uh, from using the pill as directed, so this is like the scary stat, is uh, in the United States alone is 250 abouts a year. And in the way that they say it in the paper, it's like, which is the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every year. So again, we're not wow. saying like, I, I think what's what's hard about these conversations is that you say these things and there's always someone who's like, oh my gosh, they're talking about the pill and they want to take it away and all this kind of stuff. But it's like, but wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> if you're taking something and this is literally like a, a, like a, a, a risk, should we not be able to talk about that? Like, should we mm -hmm. not be able to say that out loud? And then you get to decide if you're going to take it or not. So I've always had the stance that it, we just need to tell everybody what the side effects are. And then you get to decide, A, if you want to take it or not, or B, like if you want to take it for as long as you were planning to, or C, if you're good. And you're like, mm -hmm. you know what, this is working for me. And, um, but but that is what my, my editor <laughs> said when she was reading it. She had never heard that the, the pills and the, like the hormonal contraceptives, they have black label warnings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where and a black label warning is used when there's like a life threatening result. And she said she had to look it up and she was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And, you know, yeah, like that's, but w w when, when do we talk about that? Yeah. Um, most women think of, you know, hormonal contraceptives just like, I, I had a, a doctor tell me, she's like, I just thought of it like a vitamin. Yeah. <laughs> <So there's> something... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, they do. They recommend like, it all the time. When, but like, like when you take vitamins, like, is there a risk of like stroke and heart attack? Yeah. And like, yeah. like no, there's not. No, it, it's yeah, not FDA approved to do what it says, but that's because yeah, they just say that FDA does not approve. It's a shit store. They don't get our money. So. I, every time I go to get my um my annual exam, right, which is not annual anymore, it's every you three years. Control. And I tell her, I've told her, the woman, and I'm like, I, my partner has a vasectomy. I'm monogamous. And like, why do I need birth control? And she's like, well, and she came up with some things like, well, you're aging. And if you have um, like um, uh, if you're an emotional roller coaster and then if you get cramps and I was getting cramps. But guess what? The testosterone palette totally fucking help my my cramps i don't have pms like i used to and i'm not this is not a whole podcast advocating for or whatever so i'm taking hormones but i but guess you're not I just don't, it's, it's testosterone pellet and you're taking progesterone i think that was um, more for the, cramps pms right yeah the bi the bioidenticals is to the I, and some doctors don't like that term but yeah the progesterone um they're like pills 14 days after and then you're taking um, the dim the which is making it so your body is not which converting is natural, testosterone yeah. into yeah it's natural you can buy the health not story. converting it into estrogen, estrogen. And, and you found that 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 has helped helped you. And yes, I've talked to some other people like our dear friend Willow Brown. Love you, Willow Brown. And she's, you know, specialized in Chinese medicine and Taoist medicine and, and sexual health. And she, when we, I was like, April and I are doing this. Hormone. She's like, why are you doing that? Yeah, I could have given you all the holistic things. So like we're like, I, I, I'll speak for you, too, because I think we're the same. We're kind of a, like in the middle. We are like half holistic. And we want to know about all the things that are available to us that have nothing to do with pharmaceutical companies and vitamins and the USDA, whatever, and the Western medicine. And then we also are half, yes, like Western medicine is very important. We really value that. And we all get to make our own choices. Uh, so bring it back to this piece that April was saying about um, her stepdaughter. You know, so yeah, she's 29. So she's 29. And so so for this person or just anyone to say that it's on hormonal birth control that is having these experiences where like, I want to get off of this, but I don't want to get pregnant. Right. And that's what she said. What is that my option? She's like, what yeah. do you hear? What have you heard about the withdrawal method? And I was like, well, let's see. Let's talk to fertility. And then I'm like, Here's Lisa. <laughs> yeah. And and I know that can be controversial. So everyone just keep an open mind right now. And let's let's talk about this. It's age old method. <laughs> age old method. Yeah. Always available. Well, <laughs> I think, I mean, I think the first piece of it for someone who is open to learning more about their body and their cycle is to kind of figure out the, the like, learn about the myths. You're not fertile every single day of your cycle. That can be really empowering, especially when you're looking to come off of contraceptives, because then you can learn more about your body and you can learn that there's not, you're not just fertile all the time. It's not every single day of your cycle you can get pregnant. 
So from a st- scientific standpoint, it's the you know five days leading up to ovulation plus ovulation. So you can learn to track your cervical fluid. You can learn to track your temperature and those kinds of things. So for someone who's open to that, um, I know for me, it was this whole like in my 20s, in my, in my late teens, I discovered this method. And at the time I had decided, so to make a long story like short or less long, I was on the pill myself when I was a teenager because I had the the heavy painful periods. And so then I decided to come off of that when I actually needed birth control, which is like the opposite thing that most people do. But when I was taking it, I wasn't sexually active. And so I wasn't paying attention to the time and I had read the insert and I felt like I was always going to be terrified that if I took it two hours late, like I was always going to be a stress case about it. So I decided, okay, I'm going to use condoms and that's what I'm going to do. And then I discovered fertility awareness and I was able to learn about my cycle and understand which days I was fertile when I wasn't. And I felt like that informed what I was doing. So instead of using condoms, like condoms work, like my experience was good with them. So yay condoms. I know not everybody likes condoms, but what helped me was that then I did know when in my cycle pregnancy could happen. And that helped me to be really like, you know, you know which days count. So you, I felt like it helped me to up my game, I guess you could say. And it also gave me this option to not have to use condoms 100% of the time because there were periods of the cycle where I could, you know, opt, you know. So back to your stepdaughter, you know, in, in that situation, I think the first step that if she's open to it would be learning a little bit about her cycle so that she can kind of understand when, like what's going on at least. And then that gives her some um, information when she's first coming off of the IUD and having it removed, if that's the decision that she makes. I think that it's really useful to have a period of time where you just, you have to plan to do something else. So if she wants to look at withdrawal method, I mean, that's like, is it the most controversial <laughs> method of birth control. What's interesting about the withdrawal method for anybody who doesn't know is that within the world of couples, it is like that dirty little secret that a lot of people use and don't talk about. So whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether some you know, health professionals are listening and they're like, oh my gosh, no. Whether you like it or not, it is what a lot of people do. And what I find to be, you know, interesting in my purview is that I'm having a lot of these conversations with clients because when you're talking about charting and fertility awareness, some of my clients are trying to conceive, some of my clients are trying to avoid. And so I have all these conversations about how they're managing that fertile window. And um, the the challenge with using withdrawal and thinking about it as a non-method is that no one's ever told you what to do to optimize what you're doing. So you have Mm -hmm. no roadmap. And if you're going to use it anyways, you may as well use it to the highest possible efficacy. So withdrawal, there's limited research on it um, because it's free. And available mm-hmm. to everybody. There's yeah, who's no... going to pay for that? <laughs> well, yeah. And like, where's the incentive for the drug company to yeah. get the like 2000 man trial, right? Yeah. On, on withdrawal. So we have these little studies, which anyone would say, oh, okay, it's not enough. But this is what we have to go on. And so what's interesting when you, you look at the research, the big question with withdrawal and its efficacy is whether or not there could be sperm in the pre-ejaculate. So it's like, is there sperm in the pre-gum or not? And so there's studies that have, they test all of the men and there's no pre-ejaculate in any of the men. And there's studies that have some men showing sperm in the pre-ejaculate and some not. So then you're left with this question of, is there or isn't there? And from a scientific standpoint, you know, there shouldn't be because the pre-ejaculate comes from the Kelper's gland. And so theoretically, it actually shouldn't have any in there. But that's really the question. And the the stat on perfect use withdrawal is up to 96% effective. Mm-hmm. which is like really high. It's better than a condom, yeah. actually, if you think about hey, it. I got pregnant on the, the IUD perfect again, use- everyone. So, yeah. <laughs> These are good Perfect. Stats. Well, yes, there's always a failure rate. The perfect yeah. use with condoms is 98%. So I wouldn't, okay. I, I think that it's a, like, but that's, uh, but then the challenge, of course, with withdrawal is like, if if it, if you don't, if you don't withdraw, you have no method, right? So, yeah. so that's, but I think that that is, it needs to be said because what it means is, although there's no method that's 100%, you know, obviously withdrawal is not 100%. But it means that it it is actually like a method with mm-hmm. an actual efficacy rate. <laughs> that's what it means. And totally. so for anybody who's really uncomfortable with this conversation, that's like an inconvenient fact. So for me, I like to like work in reality. Like I have clients who are using it. And um, some of I have I've had many clients who use it successfully. And I've obviously heard lots of stories of it being unsuccessful. And so for me, I'm trying to empower my clients to do the method they're comfortable with because there's so many different if you're dealing with two people, 
everyone has their own likes and dislikes. Like, like I said, some people love condoms. Like I have clients who love condoms. They love them. Mm -hmm. I have clients who hate condoms. Fuck condoms, and but I like, love them. <laughs> and some that don't refuse to wear them. And yeah. so we all have preferences. So what do we do, right? Mm -hmm. When we're trying to figure out how to manage our birth, our, our birth control methods. And, and when we, we have a, we, we can't use hormones. So a couple of tips, I suppose. So I'm not promoting, just to be clear, I'm not promoting withdrawal. I'm not dissing it. I'm neutral. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whatever. <laughs> neutral. Yeah. Whatever you all want. Feel that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not like, just so that I'm not like pro withdrawal, I'm not anti withdrawal, but I'm based, based in the reality that a lot of people use it. So, you know, and some people use it effectively. So there you have it. So and how I many think, days can person get pregnant? Like, because before that, if they use withdrawal during this time period, like how many, is there five days in a cycle that a woman could get pregnant? It's five well, so, days plus ovulation. Yeah. So like scientifically, it's like the six day window when you're actually okay. charting practically, it works out to a week or more, like a week or to nine days if you're actually charting because you have to add like a buffer period around to confirm if you've ovulated and things like that. And sometimes your cycle isn't perfect and you might have more days of cervical fluid before ovulation and you have to consider those days fertile. So practically speaking, it's like a little more than a week, but scientifically speaking, it's six days. And in terms of withdrawal, I just want to share a couple things in case everyone everyone thinks I'm nuts, but I'm going to con con continue on the train so I can finish it up, wrap yeah. in a little bow. But a couple of things, I think one of the things to keep in mind is if you are planning to use withdrawal, one good tip is to have your partner uh, urinate before any, you know, sexual acts. So you clear, clear those sperms out. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So because the sperm and the, the pee go through the same hallway. Mm -hmm. And so if there was a previous sexual activity that day or, you know, self-pleasure, whatever was going on, and there's some sperm hanging out in the hallway, then the pee clears it out. So it's like pee, wash your penis, let's, you know, sort this out and then, you know, engage. And then, of course, the pulling out has to happen before. <laughs> so your partner has to have some degree of ejaculatory control. And that has wherever he spills has to be away from the vulva mm -hmm. because there is such a thing as a contact pregnancy, which is if you happen to be in that fertile window and you're, you've got all kinds of lovely cervical fluid going and he gets some of his semen on his hand and then he kind of, you know, gives you some pleasure, or whatever, like it's possible that that could be enough depending on what's going on. And I have seen that happen um, in imperfect withdrawal use situations. So you know, it has to be pulled out before he ejaculates. It has to be somewhere else. And if there's to be another act of sexual activity, then wash the hands, mm -hmm. wash the penis, pee again, you know, like. How long does the sperm live outside of the body? Can it live for like days? Like if you sit on the semen? Isn't sperm like only 24 hours, but the That's eggs are longer? Long or am I wrong? Well, I had no if idea. If the sperm is just like sitting by itself on the couch or something, yeah. it's not going to live very long. <laughs> I just had a visual of that. I'm reading you know. a book. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I just sat on Watching this couch and I'm fucking naked yeah. and pregnant. Like, yeah. I don't know whose baby daddy is it right now. And then, and then in your body. on the couch. Right? And in your body, if you you are in that window and you have all the, the, the fertile cervical fluid juices flowing up to five days. So mm, literally, wow. it's like a whole situation. Okay. There's like crypts in your cervix. They hang out. They read books. They order takeout and they wait for the egg to come. <laughs> <laughs> like, they are. They invite all their friends over. Like, but come outside on, of the window. Yeah. But outside of the window, if there's so outside of the window, I'm going into the, the science, stuff. but the, the yeah. cervix is closed outside of the window. It's blocked with a plug. So outside of the window, your vagina is like hostile, mm -hmm. acidic. There's nowhere for them to go. Like they can't go into the reproductive tract and they die within a couple hours or minutes. So mm -hmm. so if I learned if I was, you know, let's say um, the, the steps out of here and I was like, OK, well, get off the birth control. My understand is so I'm going to get off the birth control, give my body some time to feel into my cycles, get a greater understanding that while educating myself about fertility awareness and and so doing both at the same time. And then while I'm doing that, being very careful if I don't want to get pregnant. So probably using condoms or something during that time. And then as I start to learn about fertility awareness and see we use my vital sign, which is my menstrual cycle to see like what's happening in my body combined with like the cervical fluid and all the those things. And I do all of that. So in my average month, I have that six day, you said six days to a week, that window of being fertile. So if I have unprotected or like, you know, I don't even do withdrawal method outside of that window on these days where I don't, I'm doing all the, the, the things, the fertility method. And then I'm, so I'm only using maybe withdrawal or condoms during that window and like right around there. And then after I don't have to do those things and it can be pretty effective. But it's like science. Well, yeah. Like, so there's the the neat and tidy summary in a bow. I would say for, for someone who legit 
doesn't want to get pregnant and can't get pregnant. And I often talk about something called the um, intention scale with my clients where, you know, where are you on the intention scale? Zero is you really are not in a position to have a child. And if you conceived, you would look at termination. And then 10 is like probably you already tried multiple times the cycle and you might even be waiting for that positive pregnancy test. So, <clears throat> you know, depending on where you are on the scale, if you're like a zero or a one on the scale, then you really want to take it seriously. It is a true method. It is science-based. The symptothermal method has been shown to be up to 99.4% effective when used perfectly, putting it on par with hormonal methods. But in order to get that high efficacy, you would have to devote some time to learn how to chart and to really choose a specific method so you understand the rules and all the kind of things. So it's not just as simple as like, oh, okay, I'm going to, right? Like you, if, if this is something that if you're listening and you're like, wow, like I actually need to look into this, it would be like, well, you don't want to just, it's like getting, you know, when those truck driver licenses where you have to like learn how to do the thing with the reversing with the big oh, yeah. truck. Like you mm -hmm. can't just like wake up one day and be like, I'm just going to be a truck driver. Like you have to actually mm -hmm. take some lessons and like figure out how to back it into the thing. So, so I guess that, that, that would be the, the caveat, but yes, the takeaway is that if you did the work and you took time. So I recommend if you're not working with an instructor to take a minimum of three cycles where you're charting before you start having any type of unprotected sex. So you make sure you understand the basics and you know what you're doing in the meantime. Yeah. There'd be, have to be some sort of what are you going to do to avoid pregnancy? Condoms, like what? What's your plan? Um, and, and then that, once that's you a, have Lisa, that, do you belt, have plan Plan B? Uh, and you're in Canada. Does uh, Does Canada have Plan B? Because Plan B is something you can take in the U.S. And is that an, is that a bad option? I took like 15 of them when I was uh, a teenager. What? Not at the same time, but I was so <laughs> paranoid about getting pregnant as a teenager because my mom had gotten pregnant. She's like, if you get pregnant, your life's over, which is not what I, I feel. But when I was 15 and six, I think I was 16 when I started having sex. I used to have Plan B as a backup on top of the birth control I was taking. So or, you're on I was birth control oral and you cycling. still take Plan B the next I time. You're so paranoid. I fucking nervous. Your so hormones I took, got and I, fucked. Oh my God. Yeah, of course. But now now I'm 41 and yeah. I'm you're healed. I'm, not, yeah. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> my question for you, and I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was just thinking about this. Is that, a, is that a viable option? Not as many times as I took it. That was back when it first came out. And I'm not suggesting that. I'm just wondering, A, if that is like, okay, that could be uh, like the last resort if you really do want to prevent yourself from getting pregnant and it's in the, within that window. I think you could take it 72 hours or something. Or Is like, that an you option? Have to, you but, use like, the withdrawal method, but then he actually doesn't. His ejaculatory control goes out the window in that moment. He's like, oh, I actually did come inside right. you a little bit. Right. Plan B. Thank God is we it, have but that. Is that, right? is that, is that going to fuck you up? I mean, <laughs> well, I don't I mind think... me now. I don't care. <laughs> Well, with plan B, I think what's interesting about it, because I could go into a whole plan B rabbit hole, it's helpful to know how plan B works. Like there's plan B and there's also something called Ella. And there might be other options as well. And so those are not abortion pills. They don't stop a, like a pregnancy that's already in progress. Uh, okay. What they do, interestingly, is that they, su they, they suppress, not suppress, I should say, delay ovulation. So they're actually intended to take when before you ovulate. So when they say like 72, up to 72 hours after sex, I mean, they're kind of assuming that it's around ovulation. It's it's interesting when you see how it works. So when you take it, let's say you're in that window before you approach ovulation and that's like when it counts, right? And so, you know, and the, the withdrawal doesn't happen. So if you were to take it at the correct time um, and there's, there's more information, I, my understanding is that Ella works a little bit closer to ovulation, you know, up to like 24 hours, whereas plan B, if you're like too close to ovulation, it might not actually st stop it from happening. But so what happens is it it delays ovulation. So if a person was actually tracking, so if they're in the fertility awareness weeds with me <laughs> and they're tracking their cycle, they would be able to see that after they took the drug, ovulation didn't happen for whether it's several days or a week. And so what it when it's working as it's intended, you would have the sex, like, you know, the semen are all over the place, like trying to like, you know, do their thing. But it prevents the egg from being released so that they're dead by the time you end up ovulating later. And so one of the things that's interesting about that conversation is when you're like in the fertility awareness weeds, you understand your menstrual cycle, then you might not need to take the plan B like 15 times, because if you happen to have the, you know, condom snafu or withdrawal snafu after ovulation, and you're like literally in an infertile phase of your cycle where pregnancy can't happen, you would know that. And so you would not have to necessarily take it at that phase of the cycle. So it's it's really it's really interesting, but yes, absolutely. I've had a number of clients who have that. It's always like Murphy's law, right? Like if there's going to be a snafu, it has to be right around the time of your fertile window. But it is really interesting to to learn how it works and 
what it would be most effective and and to be able to actually track and see what's going on in your body. And to answer your question of, you know, is it bad, you know, hormonally, I think that for a lot of a lot of people who are not taking contraceptives all the time, if you happen to have that one time or two times or three times or whatever that you have to take it, it's it's not the same as bombarding yourself with the hormones all the time, especially if you're sensitive to those hormones and you don't, your body doesn't respond well. So it's like not as bad. Thank you. I had no idea about that plan B was designed to delay ovulation. I had no clue. And no one educated me when um, I was uh, 16. I guess I was 16 because I was able to drive and go get it myself. So I wasn't 15. I was 16. But that's great clarification because people do consider it. I've heard people say it's like an abortion pill. So that was really good for me to get clarity on that as well. And yeah, I think hopefully people listening are learning something because maybe I just never read the the labels of all of these drugs. Uh, so let's let's talk about something that is, I think, beautiful, your new book, right? And it's Real Food for Fertility. It's so cool because this, when did it come out? It came out on Valentine's Day, which oh, is kind of fun. Yeah. So all the, like the love and the fertility ago. and the, the baby. Uh, yeah. I Aww. love that. So you examine in your book, um, when we're recording this at six days ago, that your book came out and that's a beautiful Valentine's Day gift, but that you can do Valentine's Day all year. So you examine how your nutrient intake and lifestyle choices affect your menstrual cycle, your hormone balance as well. And you're also your risk for fertility challenges, issues, and more. So food equals a lot of your livelihood. You are what you eat. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a huge topic, obviously, to, to think about. But essentially, what we're arguing is that a healthy menstrual cycle sets the stage for a healthy pregnancy. So we're talking about creating this balance in your body through nutrition, so that not only can you have healthy cycle, not having tons of hormonal fluctuations and things. So having everything kind of functioning normally, but also using that as a platform to optimize your fertility. And the way this book came about in many ways, um, a lot of people who kind of follow my work or or Lily's work, they don't know that when I was writing The Fifth Vital Sign, she was writing her book, Real Food for Pregnancy. And so we were book buddies and we were writing it around the same time. And what I've done over the years is when I'm working with fertility clients, who are trying to conceive, I'm always recommending real food for pregnancy. So I'm having them get a book and follow the nutritional advice, you know, even though it's for her book is for pregnancy because it's it's how you support fertility. But the interesting piece of it is that I was also recommending her book to individuals who were not trying to conceive, who are just looking to balance hormones, balance their menstrual cycle, because her dietary advice is sound. We look at um, ensuring that you're consuming enough food, ensuring that you have a good macronutrient based uh, for for what you're eating, sufficient protein and fat, which really without that, you it's really difficult to make hormones and in balance with carbohydrates. So you're not just eating all the carbs and not getting enough protein or not eating any fat, which you need in order to support your hormonal health. I mean, I know we were talking a little bit about progesterone and testosterone and estrogen and things like that. In order to make those hormones, we need to have sufficient protein and fat. And so what's interesting, like I mentioned, is that for my clients who were actively trying to avoid pregnancy, not looking at conceiving right now, maybe they have a future plan at some point. It was the same nutritional foundation and strategy. And so that's essentially how the book came about. And so although this is our contribution to, you know, preconception nutrition and optimizing your cycles for fertility, for anybody who is not actively trying to conceive, but I mean, having some some challenges. We are the same age. I am 41 as well. And as we get older, we naturally become less able to make progesterone and to maintain that hormonal health. Uh, we become more susceptible to hormonal fluctuations and imbalances. And so obviously this book is primarily aimed at uh, individuals and couples who are trying to optimize their cycles for conception. But I think it is worth mentioning that for anybody who is having hormonal issues, we cover tons of it in the book. And the book is called Real Food for Fertility. But the topic that we talked about today, the withdrawal method, and how do you come off of contraceptives? And what are your options? What are the non-hormonal options? We have an extensive chapter on that, because we're also arguing that when you are thinking about pregnancy, that we're we're talking about the effect of hormones. We Today, we talked about some of the side effects. But in, in the book also, in addition to those side effects, we're talking about the effects on fertility and how hormonal contraceptives are associated with a temporary 
suppression of fertility. And we can see that in the impact that it has on the menstrual cycle. We can see that on the impact it has on the ovaries and even the delay in pregnancy that many women experience. And so we're saying, look, if you are planning to conceive at some point, you know, if you're thinking six months, a year, then you might want to consider coming off contraceptives for a period of time so that your body can normalize. And we're not just saying because we feel like it. We're showing you what the research is saying. We're showing you how the pill is affecting these bodily functions and how long it takes for things to normalize. So it's it goes beyond food because we're looking at the whole picture to support, like I said, individuals and couples who are looking to Im- improve their fertility and hormone health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So on the on the nutrient part, the the you know, and I assume nutrients isn't just like what we eat, right? It's probably like you know, the toxins, like the, the shampoos we use and things like that too. Um, so so what do both the ancestral practices and modern research suggest to be optimal for female and male fertility when it comes to macronutrients, micronutrients, meal timing and spacing and so on? I imagine like my first thought was like, ooh, the whole, uh, you know, only eat between 12 and six o'clock probably. Intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting probably yeah. isn't the best for, you know, going to try to make a baby because, you know, there's a long period of time that you're not getting nutrients. But so we what are, what do you know about those pieces there? Mm-hmm. I mean, when it comes to timing meals and the question of intermittent fasting, it's really interesting because I find that there's a lot of men to get all gendery here in the influencer space who are getting these great results from intermittent fasting or eating once a day or whatever is going on. And so then women follow these lovely male influencers and they try to do the same things. And what happens when a woman who is of reproductive age who's cycling uh, normally tries to skip meals and ends up basically, so there's, there's different ways to do intermittent fasting. One of the ways to do intermittent fasting is to fit your regular meals, so your total normal caloric intake, into a shorter window. So instead of just eating like all day willy nilly, maybe you, you know, eat your breakfast at eight in the morning, and then you finish your last meal at six, and you end up eating the same amount that you would, but you just don't eat after six kind of thing. So there's that kind of intermittent fasting. But a lot of us don't do that kind of intermittent fasting. We do the kind of intermittent fasting where we're skipping breakfast and then we eat lunch and dinner. But even though we eat more at lunch, it doesn't mean that we're eating the same amount. So it's like we're we're actually like in a caloric deficit. And what happens in terms of your menstrual cycle is you start to see disruptions, especially if you're tracking. That can be things like increased PMS, hormonal imbalance. It could be things like spotting before your period or um, irregular cycles or delayed ovulation. There can be all kinds of things that happen. So in, in terms of the question of you know, intermittent fasting, what our recommendations are, for someone who's trying to optimize their hormone health and optimize their fertility, we recommend three meals a day. We don't recommend skipping meals. And if you're wanting to do intermittent fasting, it would be like what they would call eucaloric. So like we're not eating less. We're eating the same amount that we would. We're just doing it at a certain time. So we recommend like a good protein rich breakfast. I already mentioned that concept of macronutrient balance. So the three macros, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. A lot of uh, women unintentionally under eat protein and a lot of us are really for afraid of fat. <laughs> this is like the whole 80s, right? And 90s where they mm-hmm. told us all the fat was bad. And so a lot of people are still under eating uh, protein and also afraid to incorporate fat. And then we end up eating lots of carbs. And then especially if we're active also, then we're not necessarily getting enough in order to make our hormones. And so one of the the interesting things about the work that I do is that when we're looking at the menstrual cycle as a vital sign, we can take this out of the theoretical realm because we can actually look at what's going on. Like we can have conversations about how like, I eat so great and everything's healthy and whatever. But then we, if we look at the menstrual cycle parameters, that really, the, the menstrual cycle doesn't lie. You know, we say that in the book quite a few times because really and truly, if everything is great, then we're going to see your cycle fall into those optimal parameters. It's only when you're not eating enough and you're exercising too much and you're not getting enough protein and you're you know eating too little fat and everything's imbalanced and you're skipping meals. Like mm-hmm. that's when we start to see some of those negative signs in your cycle. So I think that's one of the interesting pieces of looking at it this way when instead of just it being in a book and we're just talking about this theoretically, you can actually see for yourself as you chart your cycles and pay attention to what's going on, uh, whether or not what you're doing is working. 
Anyway, so what about uh, for because we talked about the this more so more like uh, female fertility, like I'm gonna I want to have a baby in my belly. What about for the sperm owners out there? Like, what about nutrients and how that affects them? Like, is that important for men in sperm health too? And can I ask a question to tag onto that? And is it important to think about the processed foods, you know, organic foods, things like that? Is that can that would affect this question? I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the sperm question is a huge one. So we have a ridiculous sperm chapter. And what's interesting ridiculous. about it is it's <laughs> like, it's, like it's huge. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think we cited like 250 studies. There was a time when I wanted to write a book about the sperm. I had like a, I even had like a cover printed. So Aww. I like went a little ham. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, you know, bottom line, we're putting the men on blast. Like, because because if you think about it, I always say this in a joking way because it's kind of funny, but it gets the point across. Like, I carried my children for nine months or whatever, and they came out looking just like their dad. <laughs> right. I did so, all that work. <laughs> right. Did all this work. I mean, he's <laughs> handsome, but like, you know what I'm saying? But the point of, of bringing that up is that he literally carries 50 percent of the genetic material. You know, the, the quality of his sperm can determine how well our placenta forms. The quality of his sperm can actually determine whether or not your children are susceptible to certain childhood diseases. Like there's fascinating research about this. And if you're experiencing a, a miscarriage, um, it could be related to his sperm quality. So it really means that it, it, both of our contributions are important. Mm -hmm. What happens is, as, as as I'm sure all the listeners know, like, most of the time when you're trying to plan ahead for pregnancy, it's like the woman <laughs> doing things like stereotypes, like again, going into the gender conversations. But I've worked with so many uh, female clients who, you know, they're cutting out every food they love. They're taking all the supplements they're doing all these things. And I always joke like, and he's sitting on the couch drinking beer. So mm -hmm. it's not like that all the time. But you know what I mean? Like it's it's generally thought because we're the ones that have the evidence of of everything that's going on, that we're the ones and and because we're carrying the babies, of course, you know, his contribution, but it, it, it's really essential. And so what is interesting is that when we look at kind of like the historical data, the average man in the 1940s uh, compared to the average man today, there's like a 70, 60, 70 percent decline in his number, the number of sperm, you know, his sperm concentration. So um, one of the papers I was looking at, the average sperm of a man in the 40s was about 113 million per milliliter compared to the average man today who has maybe 50 oh, wow. million that's per huge. milliliter. Yeah. That's a, so yeah. huge decline. So getting to your comment about the the processed food, I mean, the the logical question that always comes after that is, well, why? Why is there such a decline? And I wouldn't say, oh, I know exactly the, the answer, but I would say there's a lot of different factors that are playing a role. And, and certainly one of them is the food quality. So, you know, in the book, we're arguing for real food. And what is real food? It is food that you actually know what it is. If you look at white flour, like where did that come from? Like, we don't know. If we look at like sugar, like white sugar, we don't know where it came from. So that mm. is a good example of what is processed food and what is the difference between real food. When we highly process these foods, when we have all these, not only do we highly process the whatever it was that the sugar came from, but then we also process all of these processed things together to make our processed foods, right? And when we're doing that, we're losing the micronutrient content of that food as well. And we often end up with like highly processed refined carbohydrates that have a lot of metabolic consequences. So when we look at what are the reasons why this is happening, well, the food quality has gone down. Even though we're eating more food, we eat maybe more calories than we used to, we're not having nearly the same degree of micronutrients in terms of you know, nutrient density. So in, in, in the book, we're talking about incorporating organ meats, liver, you know, fish. We're talking about incorporating some of the foods that when you look at the nutrient content of those foods, you know, pound for pound, gram for gram, you're getting way more of the micronutrients that we would like vitamin B12, iron, vitamin A, choline, folate. Like we're looking at, we're getting way more of these micronutrients in these real foods that we're talking about compared to these processed foods. So, you know, when we're looking at why is the sperm quality and quantity declining? Well, diet quality, micronutrient intake, um, the rise of metabolic issues, you know, the rise of obesity due to the intake of all these other foods. But we could also look at chemical exposure. You know, I, I wish I could remember the stat you know, of how many chemicals are, new chemicals are released every year. There's a lot of chemicals that are released into the environment that have an estrogenic effect on the body where 
these chemicals, they're not estrogen per se, but they are similar enough in structure to our natural estrogens that they kind of program those estrogen receptors to have all these n- different effects. Plastics. Plastics and is known. Like there's BPA plastics. in plastics. That's why a lot of people, they'll, they'll, it's exact, It's like a synthetic form of estrogen. So you see more breast cancer. You see more exactly. cancer is occurring even in, in men. You see cancer happening. It's a lot of links to plastics and other, and you're talking about um, a similar concept and there's so yeah. much so many chemicals like the the fragrances you know like the febreze yeah. Oh, yeah. that can mess with like your you just like smell it's not good for you it's, i know it's but so people awkward. love it and i didn't yeah. know how bad it was and still until i started researching and i was like holy shit this will mess with your actual your receptors like it like yeah. what is designed to help you know if things are good or bad in your nose right it's like it's yeah. messing with your senses and it actually can and i'm not a scientist and and sometimes i give things that aren't completely accurate and try not, I'm not trying not to do that. Cause I listen to things. I'm like, wait, I was almost spot on except for one detail. So look it up. Okay. Y'all look at the, a bet, and not from Johnson and Johnson's side, look at the actual research. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, and in order for men to make sperm, they need to make testosterone. So it's, it's counterproductive for them to be bombarded with estrogen and estrogen and estrogen all the time. Right. So So yeah, so there's a number of factors, really interesting topic, but I guess the bottom line is like, guys, you're not off the hook. We scratched the surface today. Um, There's other factors like smoking, cigarettes or marijuana, like hot tubbing, saunas, like that whole old thing of like, if the the testicles are getting too hot, they hang outside for a reason. So there's a lot of interesting pieces there. And I think the reason that I went so ham on the the sperm um, conversation is because when you're trying to conceive, if you're trying to conceive naturally, if there's something going on with his sperm, often it's not looked at right away because it's just assumed that it's her problem, right? And Mm -hmm. so you could be like a year and a half into your journey and he's finally getting tested. And then if you want to improve his parameters, uh, it takes a minimum of three to six months because when he's ejaculating today, that's based on whatever he was doing three months ago. Like that's how long it takes his body to make the sperm. So it gives couples this kind of push and leg up to look at these things as early as possible into the fertility journey if you're concerned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lisa, you were so right. So it, it, the conversation, this conversation, my friend that had told me about you in, in the beginning was going through her fertility battle. It was a battle for her because she wanted to get pregnant and it all came back on her. She changed everything, her diet, her lifestyle, her like she she basically was like living and breathing fertility. And it ended up being him. He had a gen and it was about drinking beer. He had a fucking rare genetic. It's not a disease. It's like a mutation that when he would have gluten, it like mutated his sperm count. And it was all because of him. And as soon as he stopped drinking fucking beer and eating bread for like three months, they got pregnant right away. And I know that everyone's different, but I've had this conversation with other friends of mine that are dear to me that are bummed because they're not getting pregnant. And I'm like, how do you, why do you think it's your, your issue? Have you had him checked? Well, his sperm is normal. I was like, what about other things? What about genetic mutations or, um, factors in life that you don't even know? You don't even just considering. I won't go like on about it, but when you said his sperm is normal. So this is what I hear from pretty much all of my fertility clients. He's fine, which is my favorite word. That's exactly. Totally. And um, but when we look at the the guidelines, the sperm guidelines are not intended to show us what's optimal for conception. They actually are really weeding out like the lowest parameters. So when partners told that he's fine, it, it's it's basically meaningless. Mm-hmm. You would need to get those results and compare them to what would be optimal for conception because and and have that conversation. So a lot of men are quote fine based on the lower bar. And it's similar to any functional testing. Anyone who's kind of aware of mm-hmm. this whole difference between functional testing and regular testing. So like if you get your thyroid tested at the lab and they tell you you're fine, it might not be optimal for fertility because there's literally a different number mm-hmm. of um for the thyroid test when you're trying to get pregnant or immediately when you get pregnant the number changes. So it's the same idea where there's like a functional number and then there's like the regular number. And if you're told he's fine, it's basically meaningless because mm-hmm. he could be in what we call the subfertile gray area, which is that he's higher than what they're saying, but lower than what would be optimal. And that's extremely common. Mm-hmm. And last thing I'll say on that, you know, the reason that this really came on my radar 
is because I spent my like entire twenties avoiding pregnancy, right. With fertility awareness. And so that means like you're terrified of sperm. Cause you're like, if you get any sperm <laughs> near me <laughs> during this window, you know what I mean? I could be having the babies. And so then, you know, you could imagine my um, surprise when I start working with clients who are fertility clients who are trying to conceive we're literally looking at the chart. We're having, they're having the sex at the right time, cycle after cycle, after cycle, after cycle at the correct time when the mucus is flowing and nothing's happening, just nothing, 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 nothing. You can't look at that for long before you start to say, what, <laughs> what is going on here? And statistically, when you have a couple who's been trying to conceive for a year or more, if you look at those couples who are in that category and look at the men and then look at their sperm, they're much more likely to have uh, less than optimal parameters. So even from a statistical standpoint, if that's your experience, we should really be testing them. And it's not about blame or anything. It's just about from a practical statistical standpoint. Yeah, I'm going to have my friend that is in this really difficult realm right now with getting pregnant. Listen to this episode because it's so important. And it's uh, it's very I'm very passionate about it because some people that are near and dear to me have struggled with getting pregnant. And then some people that are near and dear to me are trying not to get pregnant. So this is so important. And your book, I'm curious about the book that is about just keeping your body optimal, real food for fertility, because it's not even about fertility, right? It's how is my body going to run optimally with my hormones to keep it in check? Um, and I feel like I'm a healthy person, but I love learning more. So how can people find you? I know we have to wrap up, which we could go on and on, and I would love to, but um, we want to be kind to everyone's time, including including you, especially Lisa, because I know you're busy. So your book came out uh, February 14th. Uh, where can people buy it? Where can they find you? And I believe you still launch a new episode of your podcast, Fertility Friday, every Friday. But anything else that's coming up for you, uh, please share with our listeners. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, so the book, Real Food for Fertility, you can find that on Amazon. That's that's currently the place. And we will be working on an audio book. That's like always the next question. Like, when's the audio book coming out? But we wanted to record it together. So we might be in your neck of the woods because we're probably going to record it in California because we have a great um, uh, uh, audio person there. So oh. you never know. Call um, us. Let us know. We wanna, <laughs> we'll we'll have sure. dinner. Yeah, Talk ahead, about yeah. food and fertility. Wait, all the food and, to, to and help me things. not get pregnant yes. from a guy with a vasectomy. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I can eat everything, basically. Um, well, and if this conversation intrigued you and you're into podcasts, uh, definitely search Fertility Friday in your favorite podcast player. It's been 10 years. This is year 10 for me. Um, over 500 episodes of this fun rabbit hole. So definitely join me over there. Uh, my favorite place to hang out on the socials is Instagram. So you can find me at Fertility Friday. And I just want to thank you too, because this conversation was so fun. Thank you so much for having me back. Thank you, Lisa. And also check out uh, her best-selling book, The Fifth Vital Sign. It's the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook. It really can help. Is that the subtitle, right? The Fifth no, Vital Sign? Well, is The Fifth Vital Sign, yes. Master your cycles and optimize your fertility. And you also gave a shout out to my Fertility yes. Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook, which in this day and age, I really didn't think a lot of people would be into paper charting still, but I still have a, like a solid like you know, OG client base that loves the paper chart. It, so I mean, my friend like, loved it. I love that. that like, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I won't say too much about it, but I was like, you'd like kind of like buy the paper, the print book versus the audio or buy both. But like, there's something about being able to write things down, note, like put your little, little sticky notes, it's wherever. Like, it's like, wow. it's like having a book, Stop right? It. It's all out there. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so there, those are two different things. Uh, so the fifth vital sign and, or the fertility awareness mastery charting workbook. So and real food for fertility and real food for fertility. So you've got a lot of content out there. Um, I and <laughs> I could always talk to Lisa. I love the Canadian accent. too. <laughs> oh, it's so awesome. So thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, thank you for learning. Thank you for being shamelessly amazing with us. We love you so much. Check out our book as well. It's anywhere books are sold. And uh, we will see you next Tuesday because we will Love you forever and ever, every Tuesday for the rest of your life. <laughs> All right, y'all. Ciao for now.